Hi. <clears throat> Hello, guys. Welcome to English Made Simple. I am Simon. I'm an English teacher from Morocco. I studied English literature for five years in, here in Morocco in university. Okay, well, I have been teaching online for two years and I have had students from many different countries. And I've helped them with grammar, vocabulary, speaking, and just overall to improve their English. If you'd like private lessons with me, please leave a message below and I will contact you. Great, so that's a little bit about me. Well, in this video, I'm going to talk to Matthias Lima, who is an English teacher from Brazil. I hope I said your name correctly, Matthias. Yeah, um, that's pretty much close to it. But I just tell students to call me Matthew because it practices the TH. So that's good too, all right? Okay, Matthew. <laughs> nice to meet you, Matthew. So, nice to meet you too. Please, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? All right, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Matheus Lima, um, but I just tell people to call me Matthew when, you know, international classes, Matthew is easier than Matheus. Most people are, don't have a really a grasp on Portuguese, and I don't blame them for it. It's quite a hard language. So um, I've been teaching English for almost six years now, and I taught other subjects for a little bit before that, but English is what I love and is what I can best help people with. So. That's me. Oh, yeah. And your name sounds like a god name, Matthias. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it kind of has a Greek sound to it, right? Yes. But I think it's, it it's in, um, at least from what I've been told by my, my mother, it means God's gift, I think, in Hebrew. So it has that, you know, biblical or almost godlike connotation to it. <laughs> yes, it definitely does. So, uh, Matthias, or Matthew, why did you decide to become an English teacher and not something else, like a doctor, lawyer, or engineer? So, um, I like that question because um, I don't know about other countries, at least I haven't heard a lot about it, but in Brazil, those are what we would consider in a generalized way the big three, like being a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer. Those are the professions that have the most um, clout, so as to say, and um, it's usually expected that the person should try to follow in some regard at least one of those uh, paths when it comes to a career. But um, as I grew up, I noticed that I liked a lot of things in school, but I didn't particularly uh, wasn't particularly mesmerized with any of those. So, um, in truth, I finished high school, had no direction, no path that I wanted really to go to, and I started to attend a teacher's course in the course that I had studied English for my whole life. And the moment I stepped into a classroom, I completely fell in love with it, and nowadays I don't see myself doing anything aside from being in a class with students, interacting with them, and helping them as much as I can. Or, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but, or in a classroom or at my house, because nowadays, pandemic, stay home, take care of yourselves, please. <laughs> yes, stay home, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, what has been your best experience as a teacher? I mean, maybe you saw someone had, have a really nice smile because they passed an exam so they could get a good job or something. Mm -hmm. Being very honest with you, I think that as a teacher, you probably also know that, but um, just the experience of helping a student to understand something they were struggling with and they finally get it, just that smile that slowly creeps up on the student's face like, ah, yeah, I get it. So just this feeling is really good, but in a more generalized way, being a teacher is a profession that um, I don't think people should follow if they don't take it very seriously, you know. Uh, there was a situation with a student that I have known, I had, sorry, known him ever since he was like 10, 11, or maybe 12. And I taught him um, not every year or every semester, but every so often I was his teacher. And so I kind of saw him grow up. 
And um, there was a time that he showed up to a class and he told me like, oh, yeah, I went to the doctor and I was diagnosed with the depression. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe I really need to see a psychologist. And he took that in a very joking manner. And I was like, OK, full stop. <laughs> this is not a matter to joke about. And I had a conversation with him like, um, so this is not something that we should joke about because it's something really serious. And you have my cell phone number. You can talk to me if you need any kind of help please talk, okay? Don't keep it to yourself. And when he graduated from the course that I still teach in here in Brazil, he sent me a message saying that like, the moment that you took that conversation seriously, that you showed me that it was okay to have what, we, what many people understand as a weakness, which is psychological issues, which is depression. When I told him that he would have a say, I would be able to provide him with a safe place, a safe spot to, you know, flourish and be able to be the best he can. He told me that I kind of changed his life. So I just cried my eyes out when I got the message. It was already in the middle of the pandemic. So we couldn't, you know, I couldn't give him a hug and we couldn't go out to have a talk or anything like that. But it was a very touching moment for me, one that I don't believe I will ever forget. And this is basically teaching. Every day you live a moment that you will never forget. Yes, definitely. So, and what has been the most difficult experience for you as a teacher? Okay, so it's really easy to talk about the good parts, but the bad parts exist too. We can't ignore them because being a teacher is not a magical job with unicorns and rainbows. It's hard, it's tough, and it requires a lot from you. And I think that the moment that was the most difficult one was a time in which I thought I had hurt a very young student that was not mine. And um, uh, the student got scared by something I did. Uh, the student was standing up in front of the door, like defying me, and I just wanted to teach. So I asked him, would you please excuse me? And the student didn't. So I slowly closed the door and the student started crying. And that day had already been very stressful to me. And the student crying, I was afraid that something might happen to me because of that. And I was afraid I had hurt a child. And I just asked my students to excuse me for a minute. I went to the coordination of the course. I explained the situation. And I just went back to the bathroom and I cried for like five minutes. And then, okay, we have a class. I stretched and I went back to my classroom you know, and um, people who th don't really have never been as a teacher in a classroom, they don't know how emotional it can be, how emotionally draining and powerful it can be. So the same time that it can be something wonderful and I would never do anything in that place again, it's also something that demands a lot from you. So yeah, and also correcting homework. Correcting homework is not always fun. <laughs> Sima? We might be having some technical issues. All right, while she comes back, if anyone is interested. Oh, are you there, Sima? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank God. Okay, so let's move to our next question. Um, so, um, how did you go in all the way to Turkey from Brazil? Um, sorry, how did I go there or why did I go there? Yeah, how did you end up in the, in Turkey? Like all the way from Brazil to Turkey? Yeah, it, it's kind of far away, right? You think about it, it's kind of on the other half of the world. Uh, but yeah, how I went to Turkey. So um, like I told you, being a teacher is what I live for and is what I'm going to die doing, I hope. And um, But I got to a point in my career very quickly, in my career, yeah, I, I have been teaching for six years, what a career. Um, but I got to a point that I felt like this is not very much so challenging anymore. And I thought, maybe I can go to a different place, get out of my comfort zone. And I got in contact with an NGO, a non-governmental organization. 
and that helps students and professionals get in touch with other uh, with other places, such as in the in my case Turkey. They get into con in contact with businesses and they help make this connection. And you kind of make um, an exchange program that can be of a nature that is. Um, I'm sorry about the background noise. Um, it can be like voluntary work, but it can also be something that you go to work in a different place. And there are many places that I could have chosen, such as um, places here in uh, South America, such as Bolivia, such as Chile. And then I saw Turkey. I was like, okay, Turkey is kind of far away. Should, should I? Should I really? And I applied to it with them, uh, with something in my mind, like, is there a place that I have seen myself less going to in my whole life than Turkey? Well, maybe. But Turkey is a place that I would conventionally not choose to go to. Not because I have anything against that country in a specific, but simply because here in Brazil, at least in my experience, we don't talk much about Middle Eastern countries or countries very close to that area. Okay, Turkey as a, Turkey is has a little bit of Europe all the way all the way there in Istanbul, which is a beautiful place. If anyone that is watching this has a chance to go to Turkey, Istanbul, the Bosphorus Canal is beautiful, and um, most of it is in Asia. So it's a country that has a very historical, historically rich background background. And I love history. So it was like, all right, I'm leaving the comfort zone. I'm going to a place that I know is going to teach me a lot. And let's do it. And until the, until the moment that I stepped in Turkish soil, I got to, I don't remember exactly the name of the airport. Uh, but in Istanbul, the moment that I stepped on it, I didn't realize, okay, I'm going to another country on the other half of the world, far away from everyone I know. Is this a good idea? Because some ideas, I believe that if you think too much about them, you're going to give up on them. <laughs> so you should just, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you should just act like, all right, let's do this. Let's go. Yeah, just go for it. By the way, I speak a little Turkish from movies. Uh -huh. So, Merhaba, Nasılsın? <laughs> um, I understood Merhaba because it was people used to talk to me. But I really didn't learn much Turkish there. I remember one word, which is kaplumba. Do you know the meaning of this word? Not really, no. It's turtle. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered. <laughs> I taught some kids and I had to show them flashcards. And there was like the turtle. All right, the turtle. What is the word for turtle? And the student said, kaplumba. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's a word. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. Mm -hmm. So how was your teaching experience in Turkey? So especially you don't speak Turkish. So how was your experience? Well, he, yeah, that that's an awesome question. Um, being very honest, here in Brazil, I have a personal policy, okay, that I refuse to speak Portuguese to my students until they graduate. Because it creates some mystery behind it, like, oh my God, what is his or her voice like? I never heard of it in the language that they speak natively. And in Turkish, it was that experience, but taken to the extreme, because like, I can speak Portuguese all at once, people are not going to get it, they're not going to understand me. <laughs> so it was a very um, elucidating, a very uh, strong learning experience for me. I learned a lot. I learned culturally, sorry, cultural differences I learned language differences. I learned that maybe the amount of things that I thought I knew, I thought I was a great teacher. I know so much. I have, what, three years of experience in a classroom? Yeah, that like that's a lot. But, but the height of hubris was me thinking that I could teach any student. And um, it was a very humbling experience and difficult too, because um I was kind of expecting, because I was told it would be like this, I was kind of expecting that I would have someone who would work with me by getting the English to the Turkish students. And that person was never there. That person did not exist with me in a classroom. And there were many other difficulties too, but um, I believe that now that I can look back on it, it was a mostly positive experience. Very hard, very draining, but I became a better person after leaving my comfort zone and dealing with things in a way that I didn't know I could. <laughs> you learn a lot about yourself when you're put into a situation that you're not comfortable with. And I think this applies very much so to people who are starting to learn English. This conversation is kind of about this, about learning English. So um, 
I believe that you learn a lot about yourself when you put yourself in a position that you were afraid of being in. I'm not telling anybody to do anything dangerous from the comfort of your house, learn a new language. That's what I mean, okay? <laughs> Sima, are you there? Yes. All right. <laughs> Internet. Hello? Oh my God. So, can you I hear can, me? I can, absolutely. Here? Okay. So, um, how did teaching people who were not Brazilians, uh, that is, Turks, develop you as a teacher? Um, yeah, in a way, it just kind of adds up to something that I said, which is leaving your comfort zone teaches you a lot about yourself. I discovered that I can, um, I can reach people from different places. And it was really a beautiful experience, at least for me personally, that, um, um, something that I love so much, which is music. I'm a huge music fan. I don't know how to play an instrument because I don't have the <laughs> the hand coordination for that. But um, music is something that it doesn't matter if you're from if you're from Turkey, if you're from Brazil, if you're from Morocco, if you're from United States. Music is something that connects us. So even though I couldn't necessarily speak their language, I put a song on. Maybe a song like um, a famous song from the Beatles yesterday that many people know about. We, we get together in music, in art. I think art in a generalized way is something that exists or should exist to unite us, you know? So I learned a lot from that. Oh, that's really nice. Like, uh, I learned by songs too. So my first song, my first English song was Adele, Hello. And what beautiful song <laughs> yes definitely like i still listen to it after so many years because it was it was it was my first english song that I really teach me taught me english so yeah mm -hmm. um, hello everyone in the comment section okay moving to our next question i'm um, sorry to interrupt you but hi guys i can't see the chat but i appreciate you being here thank you very much <laughs> Okay, so what are some of the differences from a Turkish person learning English and for a Brazilian or for Brazilian people? I mean, English has a lot of uh, Latin words and Portuguese is a Latin language, but Turkish is completely different. Yeah, you're absolutely right in that regard. From the very, very, very little that I learned about Turkish, it seems that the order that they make up their sentences might be different. I seem to recall, and I'm sorry if I'm saying something wrong here, but I don't remember very much. It was three years ago. But I seem to recall that the verb in Turkish comes closer to the end of a sentence. Do you know if that's correct, Sima? Mm, I'm not sure. As yeah, I, me neither. I so. just learned Turkish from movies, so <laughs> I yeah. don't know anything about grammar. So if there's anyone, any Turkish person uh, watching this, can, if you please can tell us and help us with that, I would be very grateful. Um, so even this, the working on the structure and how they understand the use of this language, like how do you insert this verb or how do you use an object in the sentence, it was something that was completely different for me. Because um, in Portuguese, as a native speaker, I can understand when a student is trying to directly translate something from Portuguese, I, from Portuguese to English, you know? I can see like they're simply Englishifying, if that's a term, the word to make it sound like it's in English. As an example, um, there's an ending here in Brazil, which would be the A. A C with a marking at below it, an A with a tilde, and a an no. And people in Portuguese tend to translate this automatically to the suffix Asian. So as an example, there's a word in Portuguese, programação, as an example, that would be could be used as coding, you know, computer coding to make... Yes. Um, 
And people might translate this word if they know don't know a lot about English. They might translate this word to programmation, which is literally saying the word in an English way and using a suffix that is kind of generalized for it. And in Turkish, I could not see that happening because as not as someone who is not a native speaker, I, w I couldn't get there with them. I couldn't be on the same wavelength uh, with them in that case. But here in Portuguese, I immediately like, hey, is that English? And they are like, uh, <laughs> yes, question mark. <laughs> so this disconnection was something really interesting to see and a big difference of how I can help students learn the language, you know? Yes, I can imagine that. So um, what do you say to those who say that it is better to be taught English by a native speaker, for example, British, American, or just someone who speaks English, but they're natives? Um, I would say maybe try to have a class with me. Just kidding. That was too arrogant. <laughs> but in reality, um, I would say that maybe people who say this have a point. Nobody is going to have such uh, as much of a perfect pronunciation as someone who is natural from the UK or from uh, the United States or Australia, as an example. They completely master the language that they speak because it's their native language, you know? But um, in that regard of going to a native teacher, I would say that if your focus is exclusively to pay attention to your use of the language, the sorry, not use of the language, but your pronunciation, maybe you were right. I will concede that, even though it you know, goes against people looking for me as a teacher, I would concede that it goes against that. However, I believe that people who speak English as a second language and teach it, they necessarily have at least one more culture as a historical cultural, uh, philosophical, and societal background than people who speak only English as a language. If a person who is, if, if that native speaker knows another language, then you just put on the toilet everything I said. But the point that I'm trying to, to, to drive uh, across is that um, maybe going for a person that doesn't speak English as a first language, that person knows better than anyone else the difficulties of learning English. A native speaker might not know how hard it is to make the TH sound, you know? It's, it's not natural to Portuguese, so I had to keep a fa, 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 making this sound by myself, looking at a mirror for years and years until I was a little bit better at using it. I'm still not perfect, far from it, but... Um, they don't necessarily know the struggles of learning that language. They know the theory, but I believe that people who had to learn that as a second language, especially in my case, especially, uh, in, especially in the cases of people who don't have that language so intermixed with their culture. Brazil, um, I, th I think maybe Alex, the person who was interviewed before, may, I think Alex mentioned this in the interview, in the podcast, sorry, but um, only 5% of Brazil's population speak English. And with that in mind, is English really a, uh, such a present language in Brazil? If so, so, so few people speak it, I would say yes, because language goes beyond simply speaking it. There are many people, as an example, that say, oh, I can totally understand what a text says. I can really understand a listening uh, audio or recording. That's really easy for me. Reading and comprehending a text easy. But speaking is another monster. Speaking is one of the things people are the most scared about, right? So yeah. with all that in mind, I believe that maybe if, you're, if pronunciation is your only focus, go for a native teacher. But if you want a more culturally diverse experience, I think you might have more luck going for a teacher who doesn't speak English as a first language, okay? Yes, definitely. Um... So, um, how widely is English understood in Brazil? Um, I would say very much so. When we are talking about linguistics, which is a subject that I study in college, and I hope there are no experts here because they're just going to see how little I know about it. Uh, but when we are talking about linguistics, nowadays with the world as globalized as it is, I think it's kind of impossible for us to say that a country or a culture with some specific exceptions, are completely devoided from other languages influencing them. 
as an example, the verb, the verb to download, which is so common in English, didn't exist in Portuguese. And we adapted it to a verb that exists in Portuguese because of the contact with the language. So nowadays, even if a person knows zero English, they're using a verb that came in some way from the English language. So I would say English is very much so known around Brazil because it has started to become part of our culture, even if we don't notice or even if it's not very clear. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say that's my stance on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, we have a very special guest here. Hello, Mr. Alex. Nice to see you. Hi, Alex. Nice to meet you. Hello, Sima. How are you? Hello, Matthew. Nice to meet you as well. All right, it's nice great to be you. here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, nice to have you here. So, uh, my next question is, what do you think is the future of English um, language learning in Brazil? As time goes on, I am seeing more and more schools starting bilingual programs, you know, and they are adopting this new method of including language, including English, we don't do that for Spanish, we don't do that for Turkish, we don't do that for other languages. We are do, doing that with English. And we are seeing more private schools inserting, and I feel like kind of forcefully, English into the subject. And so much so that there are some schools nearby, uh, nearby me that um, are already including their advanced levels of teaching. And like in subjects such as biology or chemistry, they're including English in those subjects, like the, the, the subject is taught in English. And at the same time that I'm happy because English is becoming more in touch with people, I'm kind of afraid because imagining that every person has the same command of English as the other person is kind of scary. And also because um, not everybody who is, a, as an example, very close to graduating from high school has the command of English or the means to pay for a private course. English in Brazil in a generalized way is taught in a very basic level when we are considering um, public schools because we have to attend, we have to see to every single state or at least most states in a generalized way. And um, because of that, many schools don't are not capable of teaching very advanced English to students. So I believe that the future of English in Brazil's education is bright, but it's being done in a rushed way. It's being done too fast and it's not being uh, accepting of people who are still in the process of getting more in touch with it. Alex, do you agree, disagree with me? I love to hear different opinions. Okay, well, first of all, I, I know you uh, have got experience uh, in language yes, teaching I would... in Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been teaching exactly? Um, teaching in general? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I started teaching late 2019, but I wasn't teaching English necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I'm a mountain. I'm going, in August, I'll have six years of experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, out of these six years, uh, how long did you teach in turkey all oh, oh very little time very little time i taught in turkey for approximately three to four months it was a very little time uh, i i don't know if you've got uh idea of the difference between the reality of english teaching in both countries um in some way yes um not because i discovered everything about turkey in very few uh very little time but um I noticed that in Brazil, teaching is more pro English is more approachable, and it seemed to me, personal experience, it's not the mm. truth. Mm. It seemed to me that um, in Brazil we are more in touch with English than in Turkey, because um, I couldn't notice so much so the use of English aside from very few expressions. I remember as an example when people were saying goodbye to each other with the time I was there, people would say "gurushurus," which I think is goodbye or see you later. I hope you do well. And they would say bye bye right after it was like "gurushurus," bye bye. I remember that even though it was like four years ago. Um, so in some way. I couldn't see language becoming necessarily part of Turkish language. 
but I can see that happening in Brazil. I don't know if you were listening to the, our conversation before, but I talked no, about the verb to download. Me. It's all right. I talked about the, about the verb to download becoming a verb in Portuguese. Now we have the verb baixa that you're very familiar with, I bet. This verb did not originate from, from thin air. It came from the verb to download in English. So as a person who didn't spend a lot of time in Turkey and has only my personal experience to say, I would say that we are more in touch with the English language as a culture and as a people than Turkish people are. But I, get, I granted that I might be completely wrong. Well, one thing I know for sure that the quality of English teaching or language teaching, mentoring, coaching, what I do is uh, it's going to be better because we are, are going to connect each other I mean, the teachers are going to be easily connected to each other so we can like make a very nice uh professional network in order to learn with each other that's the absolutely point. You're absolutely yeah, right. Absolutely. There's no way not to connect to each other anymore. Sima, you're from Morocco, right? Yes. And here we are, two Brazilian dudes and a Moroccan lady talking about <laughs> teaching and about learning a language. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. This is the dream. I think that people who were as in love as I am with teaching 100 years ago, 200 years ago, if they could see what teaching is becoming, I think they would cry for happiness. I know I would. I know I would because in 200 years, things are going to be fundamentally different and I would love to see it. I would love to be able to reach every single person in the planet, but I'm just me. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, so Alex, I asked Matthew this, but I would like to, to hear your opinion. So what do you say to those who say that it is better to be taught English by a native speaker? uh language in general right uh i guess native speakers can offer the opportunity to uh, get in touch to their culture to their accent so uh it, it's good to um talk to them to you know for uh, speaking but uh many times uh people who have got experience in learning as a foreign language so they are going to to be probably in some troubles because they are for instance me i can i i lived in chile and there uh i i met a girl from chile who could teach portuguese better than me because she knew exactly what uh, a Spanish speaker is uh, doing to learn. She knows the details of uh, pronunciation problems that they have, and sometimes Brazilian has no idea. So there are pros and cons, you know. I guess the process of teaching. Uh, both can teach, but a native speaker should know the reality of their learner, which many times is difficult. So, especially if they are teaching to the world. So it's not that easy. I'm not saying that is impossible, but I think it's the, it would be necessary different approach, different methodologies. You know, something that I haven't got. Uh, in touch because I have never uh, taught English or mentored people in the same class from different countries. I have never got this experience. So I guess this is uh, a tough spot from my point of view, but, but just a guess. It is a very tough question. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd like to know if uh, mm, um, one of you. What has, is your advice? I'd like to know if one of you have already got this experience, uh, like Sima or Matthew. If have you uh, have you ever got have you ever got this experience before, like teaching uh, people from different countries 
at the same time in the same class, for instance. Have you ever got this challenge? I guess it's a challenge. Yeah, it is definitely a challenge. Sima, would you like to answer first? Well, I usually had one to one conversation with people. So if I had, um, I had so many different um, students from different countries, but when I talk to them, it's like me and just one of them. So it's, it's basically easier that way because, and most of them are Arabs which I'm Arab too, and it's easier for me. But you have more experience yeah. than I did, so yeah, <laughs> please. Yeah, I, I, well, but you said everything, so you've got uh, experience uh, on people who speak your language. And um, for instance, uh, how is it teaching to someone from Japan if you don't speak Japanese, if you have no idea of teaching Japanese. It's more difficult than if you speak the language. I know that some sites, they, they have preferences for teachers who are bilingual, trilingual, polyglots in some sites, because they, you don't need to know the language in C2, C level, but enough to have an idea what kind of students you're going to have, it would be better. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Well, what do you think, Matthew? In some way, um, I don't know what it is to teach a Japanese, a native Japanese student, Alex, but I do know Turkish and I have zero knowledge of Turkish except for maybe one or two words here and there. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely difficult, especially in the environments that I taught firsthand, um, which is uh, in a private school because... Most people would look at you and say, all right, what is that Brazilian person doing here in my classroom? And I kind of felt that, but I could never really read them because reading such a way like understanding how people are behaving or what their gestures or positions of body mean. And, and, apart, and yeah, please. Conclude, uh, apart from this language stuff, there's the cultural, the habits of the country. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to a teacher from the Philippines here in Sao Paulo, and she was quite pissed off. Oh, Brazilians never do their homework. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, <complaining>. we don't. <laughs> she was complaining about this. But at the same time, she needs to make their students conscious of the importance of, of learning every day a little bit um, in out of class because they have no notion of how learning a language is because 95 percent of brazilians don't speak any other language but portuguese they don't know how how learn a foreign language is so in the philippines and another reality everyone speaks english or a lot of people speak english they are bilingual sometimes trilingual here's not the same thing you know so you need to adapt not only to the language but the the, the reality of the country which is another challenge mm -hmm, absolutely yeah, and just answering your question, um, I don't remember which one of you asked, but if I, oh yeah, it was you, Alex. If I've ever, we've ever had an experience of, you know, teaching people from different countries at the same time. Um, I don't know if I can call it like really a different experience, but I have, uh, right now, I have a private student where he comes from Galicia, okay, which is, you know, close to Spain and Portugal. And I teach also at the same time his daughter, who is Brazilian. So in a very simplified way, I kind of have two cultures at the same time. But something so extreme as an example, um, teaching a Finnish person, someone from Finland, Finland, and teaching someone from Vietnam as an example, I'm basing myself exclusively on geographical distance or nothing else. But I don't think I have this experience, which is just like Alex put it, an enormous challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, definitely, yeah. So um, what is your advice for students on how to improve their reading skills in terms of English, Matthew? Oh, um, honestly, it really depends on what your goal with improving your reading skills is. I, I think I would, in some way, I would say that to all the four skills that we have in learning a foreign language, which are speaking, listening, reading, and writing. I personally believe that if you are not enjoying what you are doing, you're not going to do a better job at learning it. So if you want to practice your reading, 
read a book about a subject that you love. Do you love um, dystopian societies? Read this book by Aldous Huxley that I have here, which in Portuguese is Admirável Mundo Novo, but in English is Brave New World. Fantastic book. Get it in English if you like dystopia, uh, dystopian cultures, like if you are younger and you like Hunger Games. This book is wonderful, Brave New World, okay? Brave New World, really good book. If you like studying more about that, get Animal Farm by George Orwell. If you're in love with children's literature, I have many books here because I usually talk about books with my students. Get The Fairy Tales of the Brothers Grimm. You have many fairy tales, all of this is in English. There are illustrations here, there are verses and poetry. If you don't find a way to love what you are doing, you're not gonna enjoy learning what you are learning. And that goes for reading. As an example, I'm one of the biggest proponents, people call me radical because of this, but I'm one of the biggest proponents that if you like a subject, go play a game about it. I learned English, ba the basics of English, I learned with video games. When I was five years old, I got Thank Pokemon you. on my hands, and I was like, I don't know how to speak this language. And I got an English-Portuguese dictionary, and I taught myself by playing games. Because, like Alex said, only 5% in a generalized way of Brazilian people know English. So I asked my father, he was like, oh, I know some basic stuff. He was a flight attendant, but I don't know very much. So I kind of had to piece English out kind of by myself in some way. And did it feel like working? Did it feel like doing homework when I was playing a video game and not understanding words? No. Watch a TV series that you love. If you like Friends... You watch Friends with subtitles on. Use your dictionaries. Nowadays, we don't have dictionaries anymore. We have our cell phones. Download a good dictionary on your cell phone. Use it to have fun. Find the meaning of this word. Try using this word while you're writing. And this is just for the reading skills. Speaking is a little bit harder for you to practice with other people, which is where we teachers come in. Um, <laughs> but the other skills, in some way, you are capable of de developing them on your own. You know, I think that writing and speaking are the harder ones because you kind of need a professional touch to be able to have that professional guide you in the direction that you want. Maybe like we discussed earlier, Sima, maybe you were studying for an exam that requires you to have a C2 writing in English. A professional is going to be the best person to help you with that. But if you have a movie that you love or you have a TV series that you enjoy, a game that you like, <laughs> um, use that in your favor. Make the experience of learning enjoyable or else it's just going to be work. I think that Alex is going to be much more, uh, sorry, the other side, the camera is inverted. Alex is going to be much more capable of expressing this to you guys than me. If he didn't love learning languages, would he have survived past the second or the third one? If it were an obligation, Alex, do you think you would love languages as much as you do? You're muted, but I could see that you no, say it. No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, okay, I, I think I got your point, uh, but I'd like to answer one question here. Uh, after 10 years, what will the percentage be? Uh, well, I don't know, math film. But who, who made this question, please? Um, let, just answer Matthew's question first. I will, I will okay. uh, ask you that question. Okay. I will hey, get uh, for I, you. Uh, well, this, I think, this is not going to change soon uh, because mm -hmm. of our reality. You know, um, there, there are a lot of um, import, more important issues than impro improve their English. Many people in public schools, they don't have even access to uh, basic things such as uh, you know, books or uh, some some schools don't have even teachers in Brazil. Some some schools they 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 need some teachers. They need more specialized teachers in some subjects such, such as math. And, and this is a social problem. And I guess mm, a hand. Or, I mean, apart from that, uh, there are all the issues as well for instance uh, most of 
uh, people who work in a non-specialized job, they don't speak English, and in some of uh, jobs such as uh, in a corporate area where I worked for a long time, I wouldn't I wouldn't know in numbers, but I have met a lot of managers in credit card companies that don't speak English here in Brazil. So this this is uh, uh, these are some reasons that make me believe that this percentage is not going to to be different in. in within 10 years. I'm so sorry I'm to interrupt you, but okay. um, I believe the question, no, I'm, I'm there with you. I mostly agree with what you're saying, mm -hmm. but just for those who might not be Brazilian and don't understand uh, that aspect about us, the mm -hmm. question was like, what do we imagine that percentage will be in 10 years or something? Okay, and the percentage percentage is related to how many people out of the 5% we currently have, how many people do we believe that are going to speak that language? Out of a population, Brazil's population is currently approaching 210 million people. So if we get 10% of that, we had 21 million, 5% is half of that, 10 and a half million people. So I think that thinking about a precedent is absolutely hard, which is why we have so many um, sciences that study this, such as anthropology, such as sociology. These sciences are responsible for that. So the person who is speaking to you about that number is someone who hasn't studied that, okay? But I believe that language learning is not something that goes up arithmetically. I think it goes exponentially. I don't think we're going to explode to half the population of Brazil speaking English in 10 years, but I do think that as time goes on, this number is going to grow exponentially rather than following something like a letter, okay? Something like this. And I, I have to reinforce, I have to talk again about what Alex said. Many are the students in Brazil that don't have access to very basic things. Nowadays, we're having classes online. So most of the students that I am in contact with because I teach in a private course, they just open their computers, they log into Zoom, they have their classes, they close it, they go to eat something, they go watch some TV. But this is another reality we are talking about. We're talking about a population that in a, in a great number are having online classes without having a computer or internet access at their homes. Some places here in Rio, which are the favelas, they're basically living war zones. So imagine a child trying to have a class online at home and hearing gunshots going by their house. It's not something simply that people don't want to learn. Some people, I'm not saying that you said Alex, okay? I'm not assuming that in any way. But um, it's just that sometimes there's an expression in Portuguese, which is o buraco é mais embaixo, which means the problem is goes much deeper than that. So talking about that percentage, even though I, it's a discussion that is extremely important and I would love to have, as you guys notice, I never shut up. Um, my classes are basically like this, I talk too much. Um, this is a conversation that is really important to be had, you know? So I have no estimation about the number of people that are going to be speaking English in 10 years, but I honest to goodness, from the bottom of my heart, hope that this number, if it increases, it touches people who are in a minority position, people who have lower access to quality education. This is my hope. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a question from Marcus from the... So if, he says, if I spend few days without speaking English, I easily lose that minimum of confidence that I have acquired so far. And it is most, it is almost as if I have to start conversation again. Do you have a good advice? I do. Go ahead, Alex. If you think that this problem we have as well, if everyone has this problem, so we're not going to be worried about it. So even us who keep in touch, if we take, I don't know, one month vacation and we don't speak English for a long time, it, it, uh, so it can uh, happen in some circumstances, for instance. Uh, I remember I was uh, 
working uh, with uh, lawyers for a long time and uh, my juridical vocabulary is not that good anymore because I forgot it. Not everything, but almost because I, I, I don't have that contact. I, I'm not keeping in touch with juridical vocabulary. So I guess you don't need to um, lose your confidence because it's not, it's not your native language. I guess you need to think like this. Well, if I'm going to get in touch with people who know more than me, or if they know some words more than me, if I can learn with them, I think you need to look at, at this point from the positive perspective, you know. So I, and this has helped me uh, make a polyglot because I prefer to talk to people who know more than me because even if people who have less, fewer experience, a fewer uh, years of experience than me, uh, or even, I don't know, uh, if they, they studied English for two, three, four years, or other language, they have something that I don't know. You know, their way, their, I mean, I don't know their backgrounds. For instance, here, Matthew studied, uh, taught in Turkey, so he has something to, to teach us. I guess we need to, to do, to think that way, that we can learn with each other. And everyone, I insist, everyone makes mistakes, Marcus. I, I talked to Marcus, right, last week. Huh? Yes. Okay. Everyone makes mistakes. The Italian, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Grazie. Uh, what do you think of you? <laughs> Is it Marco or Marcus? Marcus. Oh, Marcus. Marcus. We call him Marcus. Okay, um, Marcus, thank you very much for your question. And um, again, I'm going to have to go ahead and agree with Alex, basically, because um, there is a saying, I don't know to whom it was attributed, but that goes the following way. If you are in a room and you are the smartest person in that room, then you are in the wrong room. Surround yourself and surround, you know, I'm talking about your life, okay? A 26-year-old person, yeah, I know a lot about life. <laughs> um, but f this is something that I take for real for me. If you are in a room and somebody else is not smarter than you, then you're in the wrong place. You should always look at every person that is alive out of almost 8 billion people that we're reaching. Every single person is not going to know at least one thing better than you do. If you don't believe me, just go on YouTube and research um, Asian people playing instruments or Indian people teaching engineering or mathematics. You're going to find your geniuses everywhere and people that put a lot of effort into it. And I think it's really hard for me just to say that you don't need to lose your confidence because confidence is something that you have no power over holding or losing or letting go. It just goes away. But I'm, I'm with Alex. It's going to go away. Um, here in Brazil, summer vacation, it's around two months, maybe two and a half. And I spend that time just speaking Portuguese, my native language. When I come back in the first day of class, I'm like, speaking like this and I can't make it out. I have difficulty. And I have like six years of experience and I sometimes have difficulty. Some words don't come out. I forget Ooh. words. I The thing that we did, I don't know if you were here, Marcus, uh, a little bit earlier, but I discussed with Sima that sometimes the words just don't come out and you don't remember the word and you start translating things inappropriately but that is a part process of learning a language you're not perfect even if you were a native speaker you are going to forget yeah. some words mm -hmm. if you think about italian don't, don't you sometimes I, forget some yeah. words you got a good point matthew and sim i don't know if you have already as an english teacher uh, both mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if you have already um read something and suddenly you stop to think, oh, how, how does it, how's it in my native language? It happened to me many times. For instance, one day I was reading a poker, a poker book and there was like, there was there, most people are, and say, how is that in Portuguese? A maioria das pessoas, são maioria das pessoas, é, oh. <laughs> so I needed to uh, make a research and some Portuguese teachers didn't know how to answer my question. And I need to research one of the best Portuguese teachers uh, that uh, Matthew probably has heard about, the Pasquale. 
and, uh, and he said that this is a new rule in, in Portuguese. So this this is a, the language is live, you know. It's not like Latin that is there's no new rule anymore because no almost nobody speaks. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex is absolutely right. Language is a living thing. Um, and it's going to change basically every year. Portuguese, I think, I don't remember exactly when, but I think it was officialized seven years ago or something around that, maybe seven, maybe nine. So around that time, we um, got into an agreement with other countries that speak Portuguese, and now we kind of have a unified gra grammar set of rules, you know? And maybe next year this is going to change. Should you worry about losing the confidence mm. that you have, mm. I think that you should. The language is not confident itself. <laughs> yeah, language is not confident. Great, <laughs> and you maybe it's impossible for you not to lose your confidence, but it is possible for you to keep trying. Mm. And that that's all I can say. What I can tell you is, if you think my English is good, you can be absolutely certain that I'm not confident in it. There's always one thing that I say, oh, the accent should have been like this or the pronunciation should have been like that. But what I do is I try to go by the language so fast that I don't have the time to think back on the mistakes that I made. For just from counting, I believe that I made seven mistakes up until now in the, oh my God, 55 minutes. Um, I think that I've already made seven different mistakes, but I'm going to try my best to forget them because what is the purpose of language? Communication. Should you achieve perfect language? If you can, sure. But the most important thing is communication. Mm -hmm. The moment that people, you have the privilege, because nowadays, and well, most of the times it's a privilege. When you have the privilege of going to a country that speaks English as a first language, and you start talking to a person you've never seen before, and they answer you like you were speaking normally their language, is a moment that I hope happens to you and I hope changes your life like it did mine. I was like 12 when I had the privilege of going to the United States. I asked for directions for the bathroom. A lady answered me and I went to the bathroom and five minutes later, like, oh my God, did I just do that? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the experience. When you see it, after you practice, if you dedicate yourself, eventually you're going to speak it. And you're always gonna make mistakes and you're always gonna lose your confidence. But your job, I have to point to the camera, but your job is to keep trying, okay? Yeah, well, always. Absolutely. I think that's the biggest message that I have for you guys today. Mm -hmm. Keep trying. Everybody can learn English. I am confident that every single person can learn English or any other language that they want. Is it going to be difficult? Yes. Is English an easy language? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. No language, I believe, is easy. But... You can do it. I am. I yes. believe in you. You can do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question is, what is your advice for students on how to improve their writing skills in terms of English? Writing skills? Yes. Well, uh, I guess you you should read you should speak listen i mean you should interact skills it's the best way to improve your writing because writing and listening sorry writing and reading are considered written skills and they but the difference between them is the uh, reading is um, a receptive skill and uh writing is a productive one or some teachers would like to say input and output i don't i don't, I yeah. don't i'm not familiar with this mm -hmm. terminology but anyway um when you uh read properly or when you read or when you often read and once again read what you like don't read what you don't like um and there are a lot of things that uh, are interesting for everyone here. Yes. When you read better, you are going to elaborate your text better. You are going to uh, distinguish writing uh, 
forms like uh, we are going to distinguish what is a narrative from a description from a dissertation from a formal letter from a report and it depends on your goals depend for instance if you work in a company where you should write emails you should write uh, formal uh, emails or memos or you should adapt to your reality you're not going to write narratives if you are not uh, you're not going to be a novelist you're going to be a novel writer or you are not i don't think it's it's going to be uh, good unless if you need to work on how to tell things chronologically so this narrative is good so it, you need to uh, focus on the first reading and then you, you can uh, write better based on what you read. I don't know if I answered his question, but anyway. Well, at least for me, you did. <laughs> so yeah, I'm there with Alex. You have to do what you love. If you love to read novels about uh, drama, go ahead and read it. If you like reading horror or suspense, find Stephen books and eat them alive because there's just so many just find something that appeals to you make the process of learning better mm -hmm. and if you want to apply that to writing maybe you should find a professional to help you with the finer details but reading is the first step to good writing mm -hmm. but i guess I, I guess apart from that uh if you read with uh, uh like with the critical thinking like, I, I, do I agree with the author's opinion or not? What kind of uh, points should I think better? What kind of points should I compare to all the writers, to all the authors? So this is going to help me uh, build my way of writing as well. My style, or I mean, my opinion, how to be coherent, how, you know, on where when you write your text please. yes definitely so my last question is um are people in brazil all like you guys friendly and talkative because i i think i'm moving to brazil <laughs> yeah many people think that we are like this you know? yeah uh, we as uh, sorry alex i'm sorry please go on yeah and um normally brazilians are open to talk as so, uh, this is um one reason that i try to convince brazilians who don't speak english to learn because the world wants to know i uh, lima i want to know brazilians so they are they are they are open because if you learn another language they are going to uh, they are they want to meet and uh, to know more about our culture so and i guess uh, at the same time uh, they are curious about meeting other people because they don't speak the other language and this is a different reality oh i'd like to know this, to meet these people and but they need to face uh, this barrier and this as matthew said we can't be lazy to learn a language because it's not that easy. So we need to do your best. Mm -hmm. yeah. And well, about Brazilian people being nice, I like to think that the answer to that question is yes. I would say that we are not necessarily nice and friendly, but we are a very receptive group of people. And um, in a generalized way, we are always open to meet and hear about and learn from other people, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I'm happy that you were happy that Brazilian people are nice and we are representing our country in a good way, Alex. If that, that's her question, we are doing a good job. Nice At, least, uh, <laughs> at least at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually thinking of moving to Brazil because of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be very welcome in our country. Okay, country. but I cannot host you at the moment, Sima. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's sad. So, um, <laughs> so uh, if anyone here wants to book a private lesson with you, how much do you charge? How can they contact you, and how would you be? How would they benefit from you as a teacher? 
Uh, okay, I, I let Matthew start because I have stuff to please. Matthew. Okay, <laughs> so um, um, trying to close up on our all our conversation here, um, even though it's challenging, what I'm seeking right now is a culturally diverse group of people for us to learn together. Okay, I want us to work together and my classes are basically this. We are going to have a topic or we are going to have a song and discuss the lyrics, discuss the meaning. What do you understand from this? Or maybe a text. I always will prepare classes depending on what you, my student, will desire to have in a class. If you hate grammar, I'm going to put a little bit of grammar here, but I am going to focus more on other stuff, you know, and um I my plans are to charge ten dollars uh, per uh, for the hour of class, okay, and just to try to find a middle ground on about time. I would probably schedule them according to UK time, okay. As um, our basically the group that we're participating is based on UK time, so I would pre give the opportunity for people to show their interest and maybe trying to form some groups, not very large groups because there's like a perfect number, maybe five or seven people per group, counting me included. I think is the golden number for a class in which everybody can participate and nobody gets over um, over encumbered with the amount of things to do. So if anyone uh, liked our conversation, first of all, thank you for watching up until here. It was a long time and I really, really personally appreciate it. And I'm sure Sim and Alex do too. And um, I'm going to send my my email to both Sima and um, the channel. So it can be put there in the description. So if you're interested in the classes, you can contact me. Okay. Thank you for your interest or and for watching up until here. Okay, first of all, I'd like to talk to the person who's interested because there are several options that they might have and I'd like to know their reality in order to know what I'm going to offer them. Because, um, for instance, if someone wants to have a better uh, uh, connection on LinkedIn, I can help these guys on uh, how to get these guys to uh all the places for instance how you're going to uh, make you attract more other connections on linkedin so there are some that i i consider so but some people are these are not interesting oh they are th these things are not interesting they want to uh, just chat or just talk or just so i need to understand that uh, in order to uh, set a plan uh, for them, you know. Yes. So, okay, guys, we're going to finish the podcast here. Thank you to our guest, Matthew, for his contribution, and Alex, too. I really enjoyed this and listening to Matthew and, uh, and Alex. And also, thank you to our viewers for watching. Please leave a like subscribe and share with your friends just to remind you i'm sima a professional english teacher i usually charge ten dollars an hour for private lessons but i can do a lower price my students really enjoy my lessons and have improved a lot with my help so book a lesson now and i'll leave my my email in the description box below i'll leave matthew's email and alex's email in the in the description box below so thank you guys see you next week and have a great day bye 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 thank you bye bye thank you very much